so very quickly, uh, just a quick show of hands. Who, who here uses IPython for anything? Okay, so I have a bit of a friendly audience. Uh, for those of you who uh, don't, uh, haven't used it, IPython began its life as my, my official thesis procrastination project. Uh, and, and that's because I was doing a PhD in particle physics and, and needed to analyze data, wanted to switch from proprietary tools to open source ones, as many of uh, some of you in this audience I know have kind of a similar mindset. And, uh, and Python was a good language at the time, but it was missing an interactive environment where you could actually analyze data, plot, plot things, access your local files, etc. And obviously, I don't need to justify to this audience why that is important. Um, and so thus was born IPython. I did eventually graduate. And, uh, and for a long time, it was, it was a shell, a, a terminal standard uh, REPL type environment. But over the years, it has grown into a fairly complex architecture for interactive computing and data analysis in sort of arbitrary scientific contexts, but with an emphasis in trying to tie together the process of exploring your data, the process of running your code, the kinds of things that have been discussed here already, together with the insights that you extract from that data, the communication, the publication, all of it tied up with a mindset of having all of that work be reproducible, be easy to share, be easy to collaborate with others, and be easy to build upon as we actually try to do science and not just get papers uh, line, lined up in a CV, which I know those two things are supposed to be the same, but they're not, believe me. Um, so it began, as I said, as a, as a very quick sort of afternoon hack. It was a, a very small... Uh, Python script today, this is a project where I can't take really any of the credit anymore. It's just a, a, a large community of contributors who, who do really all the hard work. The project has evolved into something that is uh, starting to approach 200,000 lines of codes for one of our repos. This is actually just a count of one of our repos, and at this point we have, I don't know, 20 or 30 repositories. It's a fairly large project. Um, the, uh, all the hard work, as I said, is done by a number of other people's in, uh, people in particular. I want to um, Credit Brian Granger, my co-PI at uh, Cal Poly in the physics department at San Luis Obispo, but we have a number of folks at Berkeley and at Cal Poly, um, at companies like Rackspace um, and in the kind of open source community. Um, there's also contributions from industry. Uh, this is a project that, uh, that has received a number of contributions and kind of active work also from industry, standard BSD license story. Um, and we do, we, I want to thank, before I get into the demos, uh, when I also to switch gears, uh, both our kind of academic and industry contributors who, who actually have, have made all of this, all of this possible. Um, so because I, this is meant to be a short talk, I'm actually not going to spend a lot of time on the basics and the, and the, and the elementary introduction. There's a lot of those out there. I want to focus on a couple of things that are newer um, in that that may, be, that may be of interest um, to some of you. The first is what, what we're calling, uh, or what I refer to sometimes as just-in-time graphical user interfaces. And the idea is, um, in, inter in, in interactive data analysis, you often uh, need to program things with a, with, with a pure scripting language. And the reason is that you typically don't know in advance what it is that you're going to do. And there's nothing like expressing your ideas in a programming language. But sometimes there are tasks for which a GUI is a useful thing to do. Typically, I've just never written GUIs ever in my life, and I'm going to die without writing actual full-blown GUIs because it was too painful, it was too annoying. But there are, there are cases where you might want to have a little bit of interactive control to explore a problem. And one of the things that we've tried to do is precisely to make that possible. Um, let's imagine that I want to compare two images. I've read this, this, this is an example that I happened to write right before a talk that I was giving in Sheffield. And the University of Sheffield had just changed its logo. And so it was a good example of comparing two images. What, what are the changes between these two images? In this case, you could do it visually. In a more subtle case, you might. Um, you might uh, want to use a different algorithm, but let's take these as an example. If I want to compare those two images, I could write, I could imagine a couple of different ways of, compar of comparing them. Blending between one and the other, shading, dragging a shader, kind of a shader that shows me half of one and half of the other. And if I write a couple of ways of comparing those, which with NumPy is very, very simple, um, I can here call up, call up this code and say, compare these two. And, uh, and show me 70% of one and 30% of the other, or 20% uh, of one and 80% uh, and of the other. But every time that I make that change, I have to go and type that parameter and change it again. This is exactly the kind of thing where you say, I just want a slider, right? I just want to drag that thing. But I don't want to write GUI code. How can we get both? How can I get a little bit of graphical control over my parameter space while just staying in the workflow of writing my code and loading my data. So what we've done is we've added to IPython the facilities for you to say, I want to interact with that comparison function, but I want to fix my input images 
and I want that parameter to vary between 0 and 1, and I want the method of comparison to be this dict. And by simply writing this, I automatically get this control that lets me drag the slider and produces that, basically this localized graphical interface that lets me say, oh, I want to compare with a vertical shade or with a horizontal shade instead, right, which goes like this. Or, for example, I want to blend between the two images, and so now it's one image or the other, and I can see the blend between the two. So you can see how this much code I'm willing to write. That is the entire amount of code that I had to write to get a graphical interface. And I don't have to spend six months wondering what is the GUI that we're going to write for this analysis, and by the time somebody actually spends the time building that GUI, then the kind of thing you want to do is something else, right? Instead, you can call up just a little bit of graphical control uh, to explore the problem you have in mind, and then you just keep going with the rest of your code. And with a little bit more work, you can turn these things into a small. Now you can basically wrap that up into a function call, and now you have libraries of basically small on-demand interfaces that you can call up when you need to load a data set and do a little bit of exploration. But otherwise, or and that stuff is calling arbitrary code, that stuff can talk to an instrument, et cetera. But otherwise, you maintain you maintain the kind of the normal workflow of expressing your ideas in a more lightweight fashion and easier to re, uh, reproduce manner. And so here now I have a little library that I can use and it can have control like swap the images, do the layout automatically or, or let me change layouts. This is just to show that you get a little bit of a more sophisticated interface that is accessible to you as a function call. And so hopefully this lets, you, lets us kind of, instead of think that there's a, a, a big divide in scientific data analysis between scripting and complex graphical interfaces, it lets us say, no, those two things can actually live together and you can grow just enough graphical control as you do your analysis as needed while maintaining the ability to do, to do scripted, um, kind of scripted code. And what is happening, by the way, in case it wasn't clear, is that as I drag these things, the underlying code is being called again. This is not, I didn't write a big JavaScript thing. All I wrote was one Python function called compare, right? And that Python function then is being controlled by these sliders that call back. So you have very lightweight interactive sliders that go back and execute arbitrary code. In this case, it's running on my laptop. That could be running on your Spark cluster, on your whatever very large scale backend, and you still have interactive control to, through the browser. The, other element that I want to highlight is that the IPython project is growing increasingly into a polyglot project. Um, I've, been, I've spent a lot of the last 14 years of my life trying to make the open source scientific Python ecosystem a viable environment for scientific work, but there are other programming languages out there, and ultimately, at the end of the day, the point of all of our work should be to understand nature, in this context maybe to understand the brain, uh, not to be specifically bigots about any one language or technology. And so we're trying to build into the, into the project as much as many tools to make it possible for you to do your work with whatever tools are most relevant to your problem. So first of all, when you work inside of IPython, that environment is actually a very, um, a very polyglot system that is capable of doing things like Start, uh, start in Python and then load Julia support. Who here has used, at least played with the Julia programming language? So I can see the language geeks in the audience, right? Very exciting, really interesting, really interesting language that may, people are excited about. So I can load the Julia support and here I can execute this bit of code. And if you notice, this bit of code is in Julia, but it's actually calling NumPy and it's returning a matplotlib figure. So the Julia and Python interpreters are wired together in memory. So when I run this code, I get a matplotlib figure. And then I can grab that figure back in Python, extract it from the Julia namespace, and continue manipulating it in Python and move on. So I can integrate Julia effectively as another piece of my Python runtime. I can do the same thing with R. So this is an example where I create some data in Python and I load the R support. And now with this block right here, I'm telling it, I want to fit a linear model of y as a function of x, but x and y were created in Python. I want to pass them to r, do the analysis in r, and when you're done, I want the variable x, y coefficients that contains the, the coefficients of the model fit. I want those back in Python to continue. And this is a call to r. I can also load things like ggplot. This is a standard ggplot call. I can call libraries like Cython to speed up my Python code. So if I have a little bit of Python code that I want to annotate with Cython to make it go faster, all I have to do is say double percent Cython. I add 
some type annotations, and now that code will execute in Cython much faster, which may be that bit of annotation may be the difference between your analysis finishing in five minutes and taking two days to run. Um, you can even, if you need to, Fortran is still a very high performance language, so this is a bit of a curiosity, but the point is, here's a high performance language that you can use as a scripting language, and I'm plotting here a function created in Fortran, but I can go back and change it, and I can say, oh, maybe I want x squared here instead. And here, I've changed the function in Fortran, and I'm basically using Fortran as a scripting language that I'm manipulating from the Python side. And all of these calls that I've made, they're all operating in the same process. So right now, I have a process that is accessing from Python. I have Julia loaded in memory, R loaded in memory, Fortran libraries, and Cython optimized libraries working together with all the same data in the same process. In addition to the fact that I can also do things like double percent bash and call out to the shell. And this is all one document that I can share with someone else. So these ideas have made the project evolve into what we're calling Project Jupiter, which is basically to take the parts of IPython that are not just Python, but that can deal with other languages, right? And so leave the parts that are Python specific as Project IPython, and everything else that is agnostic to the programming language that we're using, we're calling that Project Jupiter. And with this, we see how now we have completely native support for many other languages with the same environment. So I was using Julia from within Python. This is now a notebook which is natively in Julia. If you see the little logo here, it's different. And in here, I have those same interactive widgets, in this case, creating an n by n random array, or in this case, changing the, changing the colors the colors of a color map, but this is now Julia syntax. This is not Python syntax, so we have the same widget architecture, the same network protocols, the same file formats, the same on the wire data transfer, but with a Julia backend instead of a Python backend. This is an example of a native R notebook. This is pure R for those of you in the audience who like R. This is the same notebook, but using pure native pure native R, so there's no double percent anything here. It's a pure R process running in the back end, sending the data over zero MQ sockets and encoding it in JSON using native R. Uh, one last new toy that we merged yesterday is, now if you're logging into a remote notebook server that is running on your cluster, you can type ls, and you can have a terminal running inside of the server, and in fact, you can have multiple terminals and they synchronize remotely. So, so they're autom if you have multiple people logging in together, you can do collaborative, collaborative terminal access in addition to the notebook part, which, and this is a terminal good enough to run, to run Emacs in a window, for example. And so it's actually a full VT100 shell running through the browser. So th what that does is it gives you a server that you can park next to your data for reproducible research, and you have complete access to the entire system. And this is actually being used by people to, to do science, right? This is not just a toy that we play with over at Berkeley. People are doing really interesting work with this. There's a gallery, there is a gallery kind of showcasing the kind of work that is being done, but for, the, for this audience, I want to highlight a section on academic publications, peer-reviewed or, or preprints, that have been done for scientific purposes using this machinery to create the results and to, and to produce the publications. And I want to flag one from Mike Wascom, who's in the audience and whose talk, sadly, I'll miss tomorrow, on, on, on goal-directed uh, cognitive tasks and their representations in, in uh, prefrontal cortex. And if I, this is the paper from Journal Neuroscience. Congrats to, to Mike, uh, uh, great job. I actually haven't read the paper, but, uh, <laughs> but congrats for getting it published. But the point I wanted to highlight was that if we go, for example, to this figure right here, I can go and open the, Py the IPython notebook that created that exact figure. Because what Mike did was he actually put out, he put out in, in addition to the paper, he put out the notebooks that produce exactly all of those results. So anyone can grab his code and his work and actually uh, reproduce it and build upon it. So hopefully this gives you kind of a quick overview from where it was born to actually getting, getting neuroscience published uh, in a collaborative reproducible manner. And I'll be happy to take some questions if we have a minute. Thank you.